everyone, this is Katie Wilson, art director at Pizza Today and producer slash sound engineer for The Hot Slice. Just a quick heads up before the episode starts. This was recorded during what we hope was the height of the COVID-19 crisis. So your local policies and regulations may have changed since this recording. Um, please visit cdc.gov for more up-to-date information. And as always, you can visit pizzatoday.com for pizzeria-specific guidance during this time. Uh, We hope you're all out there staying safe, uh, staying pizza strong, and uh, we're all in this together. So thanks for listening. Welcome, everyone, to The Hot Slice, Episode 3. I am Creative Director Josh Cowan. And I'm Denise Greer, Executive Editor. Uh, Yep, guys, welcome back. It's Episode 3. We made it three episodes I'm having a lot of fun with this, Denise. How about yourself? Oh, I'm loving it. It's just, it's so great to be able to have these in-depth conversations because we are having these when we're out on the road um, and to be able to share that in a long, in-depth way is really fun. And today's conversation is with our June uh, cover 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 man, <laughs> <laughs> Max Ballier of uh, Pizzeria Lupo in Louisville, Kentucky. Denise, give us a couple of highlights, what we're going to hear today. All right. Well, uh, Max is such an interesting guy. Um, you know, he started out uh, in kind of working in restaurants, in pizzerias, uh, and he did a trip to Italy when he was a teenager and just fell in love with Neapolitan pizza. And so he kind of charted his course to uh, eventually open a Neapolitan restaurant, but it's definitely been uh, a little different way to go. He actually even had a taco truck at one point. Um, Right. uh, It's in a a really good taco truck. Like anytime I saw that taco truck in the area, I was jumping on that. Oh, I used to hunt it down. Uh, But uh, in, in finding his location, he found this like dynamite spot that is just I mean the atmosphere and um, just the dining experience there is so unique and so Neapolitan yeah uh, I guess this past September we took a team of the the whole Pizza Today Pizza Expo crew we had a dinner there and uh, it was absolutely fantastic we had a wonderful time oh it was amazing I mean I think we ordered everything on the menu (laughs) we did did. and then Max come out and talk to us all after that so you know it was the like I said I've never really sat down with Max before and and had a really in-depth conversation about uh, the beginnings of Pizzeria Lupo and whatnot so this was a fantastic experience so I hope you guys enjoy Max Ballier Hey everyone, it's Katie, art director at Pizza Today, here to interrupt your podcast with a short commercial break. Performance Food Service is proud to deliver high quality products, innovative technology, and custom operational solutions to restaurants of all sizes across the country. The flagship division of Performance Food Group with deep roots in the restaurant industry, Performance Food Service has been the exclusive distributor of the Roma family of brands for more than 65 years. This signature relationship has allowed Performance Food Service to become a leader in the pizza and Italian segment of food service nationwide. And now back to the slice. Uh, Max, you know, right now you're uh, you're in a unique situation that we've kind of never been in before. Uh, you know, what's what's happening right now with uh, with Lupo? So, you know, we have shut down. Um, we started doing carry out like a lot of other folks, uh, you know, in, in in compliance with the governor. He was saying, you know, you've got to you've got to shut down to the public, uh, which was, you know, just a total i mean we we saw it coming a little bit but you know no one can really prepare for that um so we we did carry out for a little bit and you know it it got to a point where we were definitely making the sales that we wanted to in order to pay the staff that we were you know luckily being able to employ during that time um but it wasn't doing much more than that and it was um it was getting to a point where you know, we, we were coming to work and I was saying to the staff that was still working with me, you know, this is, you know, this is for you. And if if you don't feel safe, if you feel like you'd rather stay home, um, you know, that's your choice because this is we're doing this. We're, we're trying to pay payroll right now. Right. We're not trying to make profits. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we had some long conversations and we had we eventually just decided to just completely shut it down which, you know, is such a heartbreaking thing to do. Like something I never thought that I would like, 
have to, you know, face this year is like completely shutting the doors of my business. Yeah, you know, that's, that's tough. This is my baby. Right. And it's just, it's, a, it's heartbreaking, you know? Um, but yeah, that's what we've done. And, you know, we're, we're making plans and we're, uh, we're looking forward to when this is something that is in the past. Um, but yeah, for right now we are, we're just kind of biding our time. How are you kind of using your time right now? Restaurant wise. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff that needs to be processed. You know, there's stuff like food that is going to go bad. We've been doing our best to just, uh, make it available to all the staff mm. who, you know, mm -hmm. all got laid off on the same day, you know? Um, and so we've done, we've done a lot of things where we've put together little care packages and just, you know, sent out a mass text that was like, you know, Hey, come get grocery bags, come get, you know, if you need a bottle of booze, if you need some toilet paper, just come and get it. Um, and so we kind of set up the restaurant like a grocery store, really, for the for the employees. Oh, okay. uh, and that works great. I mean, that was a great way to not only, you know, take care of our people that we, you know, are feeling for right now, but um, it it gave us an opportunity to, to not just throw away, you know, thousands of dollars worth of product. So that's pretty, that's pretty ingenious. I, I love, I love that. Uh, yeah, you know, and it's a way, out. it's a great way to take care of your people too. Uh, and if, if I can guess correctly for you, I imagine that not being able to be in your kitchen is driving you mad. So, you it know, are you, sure. are you currently working on um, some creativity at home even, um, or, you know, if you're able to get in the restaurant, how are you able to get those culinary juices flowing? Well, you know, like a lot of other people, um, I'm making sourdough bread at home. Uh, <laughs> you know, for me, it feels a little bit more like it, it's more like what I do, you know, in a day to day. Uh, and yeah, it is cathartic. And it, it's, you know, I understand why so many people are doing it right now. Um, but yeah, you know, just maintaining a sourdough mother and just making some making some loaves. Um, I've got some project vehicles I, I, I kind of tinker with. Uh, so I've got some garage time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's mostly just, you know, a lot of video games and, uh, <laughs> waiting it out, and booze, yep. you know, yeah. <laughs> like, you like everybody else, I guess. Before we go into, uh, your, Lu your Lupo story, um, you know, how, how do you envision, um, you know, you're reopening and getting back to, you know, it, it may not be the normal we were used to. Maybe it's a new normal. Um, you know, how are you kind of looking into that? Um, so, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think that it's going to be different from now on. Um, but in the more immediate, I think that, you know, we're not going to see, and this is just my prediction, we're not going to see restaurants fully opening, um, before a lot of other things. Uh, and, you know, I've seen all kinds of, you know, experts talking about it and, you know, what they predict is the timeline. I think, I think the reality is that just nobody knows right now right. because this is uncharted waters. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when we get to reopen, um, I think obviously there's going to be a lot of excitement, um, you know, for a lot of these employees, these are people that I work with every day. You know, we, we text and we've been, you know, on phone calls and stuff, but like, I haven't seen them in a month mm -hmm. now, right. which feels very unusual. I mean, this is my, this is my work family. Um, and so it, it there's going to be a lot of excitement, um, and, you know, going forward, depending on what, you know, the experts are saying is the, the safest way that we can do it. We'll operate business, you know, in that way, first and foremost. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's going to be. I think it's it's gonna it's gonna force us to not take things for granted anymore. Yeah, Absolutely true. You know, I, I would kill for a slow Wednesday right now. Um, that just sounds so refreshing. <laughs> um, yeah, you're gonna have to but, kick you know, people I, out of your restaurant. You're not gonna want to leave once they get no. in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's well, and I, I think that that's true. That you know, there's gonna be um, there's gonna be a, a, a kickback. There's gonna be like a a, a lot of people that are cooped up and they want to go out, they miss their favorite restaurants. And, you know, they also want to show them support because they know that they've been hurting. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that once everything does open, uh, there will be some sort of, you know, stimulus, if you yeah, will. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what we've been hearing as well. Uh, so we're going to take it way back. And I'm talking back because I have a full confession. I used to chase down your food truck. I no. would go find you well, because yeah. you did have the best tacos in oh, the history you. of the city. So um, oh, wow. uh, so I, I did love those. So why don't we talk about how it went from a taco truck <laughs> to sure. a very beautiful mm -hmm. and delicious, uh, you know, Neapolitan style restaurant. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, you know, the taco truck for me, uh, I started in 2011, I was 25. Um, and it was kind of like, for me, it was an opportunity to be my own boss, be the owner of a business uh, with, you know, the, the lowest overhead that I could could figure out. Um, it was, it came from, I think, in me, I, I have this draw towards, you know, just being in charge and, you know, being, you know, I, I want to do it. Um, and that was the only way that I could figure out how to do it. You know, I didn't have a name yet. I didn't have money. Um, and so, you know, the truck made the most sense. And at that time, you know, in Louisville, there weren't any other food trucks. Yeah, this is 2011. Uh, I guess that's probably right at, right when the boom kind of uh, food truck started. Kind of started yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when we started, it was us, Little Cheesers, and uh, Morels, the vegan truck, which is still going in a different capacity now. But uh, you know, that was the that was the original lineup, um, and you know, there was a lot of like. Uh, legislation and like we we sat at a bunch of city hall meetings and you know we did all the the legwork basically to get the laws written on how they could do it um, and that that was an interesting experience for me it definitely like you know formed how I look at business and you know dealing with the city and communities just to do what it is that you want to do um, but yeah, you know, for me, it was, it was a love of Mexican food. Um, you know, I'm from California originally. My mom raised us on lots and lots of Mexican food. Um, and so, yeah, the truck made a lot of sense for me. Gotcha. Um, yeah. and yeah, we ran that for, I mean, I'm still running it. Um, we, we do a lot less events than we used to do. Um, but you know, it's still going. And, you did but, you a know, couple me, taco Tuesdays, always, didn't you? Through your restaurant. Yeah. Did, yeah. <laughs> Uh, which okay. was, I, I felt like it was a little awkward because, you know, I'm, I'm used to making these things at a truck at it, like a festival and like bringing that into our Neapolitan pizza menu is, was like, it was just, I mean, uh, a, yeah. a taco Surreal. pizza restaurant is probably my absolute heaven. Yeah. Two favorite foods. Yeah. Uh, I go they back were, and forth. Busy yeah. yeah. Now I tell you what, right now, if you would roll that around my neighborhood, the, your truck, I, yeah. I would come out of my house with cash. Just I need tacos. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, man. And you know, I've, I've heard that a lot um, from people have been, you know, blowing up the Holy moly line. And uh, I don't, the truck, like uh, like it is now, it's not in the state where I can just jump in it and go, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, uh, it needs a little bit of work. So, what um, what did it take um, as you were envisioning this uh, this whole restaurant? How did that even start? Where where did you get the idea of Neapolitan Pizza and um, and get it going? Uh, well, so, you know, the, like I said, the food truck was just kind of what I could get my hands on at the time when, when it happened, uh, in the back of my mind, my dream since I was a teenager was to be, uh, to have a Neapolitan pizza restaurant. Um, you know, when I was a teenager, uh, I took a trip to Italy. Um, and you know, when I was there, I, that was the first time I had ever seen, Italian style pizza period, but that was the first time that I had ever seen Neapolitan pizza. And, you know, the, it's, there's a lot to get wrapped up in with the, the romanticism of it, you know, the wood burning oven and, you know, just these cool dudes that are just, you know, working the, the peels. So there. effortlessly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they just, they look like the coolest guys you would ever want to meet. And then you get this pizza and it's different than anything you've ever had. And you realize, you know, pretty quickly, that like this is this is a style that is rooted in you know the absolute origins of pizza, um, and to me I was just you know completely blown away. And when I got home from that trip, uh, when I was a teenager, you know immediately uh, I started working in a restaurant, 
uh, that had a wood burning oven and was doing Neapolitan pizza. Um, this was Primo, which was uh, on Market Street. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah. when did you move to Louisville from California? Uh, when I was pretty young. Okay. When, I, when we were, when I was five. So okay. it was like 1990. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, the first job, you know, at Primo was incredible because, you know, I had fallen in love with this style of pizza. And now, you know, there's a wood burning oven in front of me and they're saying, you can run it. Go ahead and go. And, you know, for me, that was such a, you know, at a young age to get that experience, to fall in love with it and then get to actually do it just all within, you know, a summer. <laughs> uh, just it hooked me yeah. pretty hard. Uh, and so, yeah, my dream has always been to do a Neapolitan wood burning oven uh, pizza experience in, in some in some way. Uh, and I've dreamt about it ever since then. Uh, I've worked a lot of different pizza places, and that was always kind of like in the back of my mind. Like one of these days, we're going to have this brick oven pizza. We're going to do it exactly the way that I want to do it. Um, and, you know, it's been such an honor and a blessing to have it, you know, materialize yeah. after so after thinking about it for so long. So when did you start putting it on paper and actually, you know, getting the, I should say the, the, the business uh, things in line to, uh, to prep for opening a restaurant? I'd say 2017 was when we, you know, broke ground on, on Lupo. Uh, but we, and when I say we, I'm talking about my sister and my brother-in-law who are partners in the yes. businesses. Um, and, uh, we started working, I'd say 2015, 2016, probably, um, you know, and we actually, you know, not a lot of people know this, but we looked at several places. We, we actually had contracts on other places. Um, and it wasn't until we found the place that we're in now that we, we got it working in early 2017 yeah and tell tell yeah. everyone a little bit about your uh your spot because it's a very yeah. unique spot and it's yeah. kind of off the beaten path too so i'm very interested sure. in and in how you how you got uh so much notoriety and um and you know just uh you were packed from the get-go yeah um well it it is uh it's an unusual spot for sure you know you know for people that aren't familiar this is kind of down uh, down the street from Frankfurt, across from an impound lot. Um, it's tucked away. Like, we're literally absconded by this 10-foot flood wall. <laughs> um, it's like... At least you're on the you right know, side of the flood wall, though. Yeah. You're on the good side of the flood yeah. wall. Well, no, no, no. We're on the no, wrong side. No, they're on the wrong side of the flood wall. Oh, they are. Yes, they are. Yeah. Okay. No, we're on the river yeah, side. Yeah, on the wrong side. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that, it's funny you say that because there's there's uh, neighbors that have said, you know, we've seen the water come up to our, our front doors. And if you look at the Louisville, like, uh, you know, information, the, the census information or, or whatever, they'll say that the water's never come up higher than this. But then the neighbors that are yeah. right by the restaurant, they're like, no, 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 <laughs> it's come up here. You know, ask me how I know. Uh, but yeah, that, that location is definitely quirky. It's weird. Um, it's, you know, when, when, when I first laid eyes on it, I said, this is a spot where if we're going to do any business out here, we need to have something different. We need to have, this needs to be a destination. Uh, and people aren't going to go to a destination location without a purpose. So we need to throw out the idea of doing anything, you know, that, that anybody can get anywhere more convenient. Um, and, you know, for me at that point, obviously I'm driven by the idea of doing Neapolitan pizza. And in my mind, you know, there, there wasn't, um, there wasn't anyone doing what I thought needed to be right. done with Neapolitan pizza. Uh, in other cities you see huge scenes, of, well, you know, relatively, uh, you see, you see at least three to four spots per se. at least, you know, even a midsize city, you get like at least three or four spots that got a Neapolitan pizza. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly right. Exactly right. And the fact that we didn't have one in Louisville yeah. bothered me because it's it's my it's my passion in pizza. And um, you know, I said if there's if there's a destination if there's a destination concept that I can put in this location, it's Neapolitan pizza. Absolutely. So it's, so with it being probably the first Neapolitan pizza in Louisville, you had to do a lot of training training of your guests, I guess, as well. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and that continues. I mean, there's a lot of people that um, that have a hard time with it. And, you know, I understand that because 
Louisville, as far as I know, and I'd, I'd love to be shown if I'm wrong, but I don't think Louisville has ever had Neapolitan pizza. Mm, yeah, exactly. um, we, we've definitely had wood-fired pizza, brick oven pizza, um, but none that like follow enough of the rules of Neapolitan pizza to be considered, you know, a Neapolitan restaurant. And this, so this yeah. region is very, um, you know, that they like their thicker pizzas with a lot of cheese and things, you know? So, yeah. I mean, that's, I know you have to overcome that right off the get go, uh, that you have a thinner crust sure. and, uh, you Maybe know, two <laughs> toppings, <laughs> three yeah. toppings max. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, we, we never put a limit on how many toppings they could get. Um, but you know, we have to make them a little bit more sparse when people order like, you know, the way that they would order at other pizza restaurants in Louisville, yeah. because, you know, a lot, a lot of people are used to that kind of, you know, I'm going to order 18 pound pizza. supreme pizza. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's not going to work. Um, I'm going to make it as structurally sound as I can, but I, I think you're misunderstanding the style here. Uh, but yeah, guiding people is definitely the move you, you want to, the last thing that anybody wants is to feel stupid about ordering a pizza um, and, you know, guiding people and trying to tell them like, look, this is, this is a little bit different than what you're used to roll with it. You know, just give me a chance, um, you know, and, and kind of gently guide them towards that. And then you can get people that, you know, have never had Neapolitan pizza mm -hmm. and say, this is incredible. I don't know what this is. I don't know why this is, but this is good. So now it's educated. as you were developing your menu, um, did you do some additions to your menu, maybe a little bit for this specific market that you have versus maybe the big idea of what, what you were thinking with your Neapolitan pizza? Um, you know, I'm not good at making concessions like that. I, I'm a little stubborn, um, and for better or for worse. And, you know, the, one of the big things when we started and part of my personal style is, you know, I don't really like to work with ingredients that are too far out of the wheelhouse of how they were traditionally. Um, you know, we just recently added pepperoni to the menu um, for the first time. And this was probably six months ago. And, you know, before that, you know, we had people coming in asking for pepperoni. And we had soprasada, you know, because pepperoni isn't an Italian thing. It's an American thing. Uh, now, you know, full disclosure, I love pepperoni. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, <you> know, <laughs> yeah, it's, there's nothing not to love. But like, you know, when we're talking about my idea of Neapolitan pizza, it usually doesn't include pepperoni. Yeah. So, you know, in the last six months, we, we put it on and we've got these very beautiful, you know, Detroit style pepperoni cups like the the small ones um that you know crisp up up oh, yeah yeah i've drooled over those on instagram definitely yeah yeah they're they're beautiful speaking my um, language and you know for me it's it took it took the first year and a half to say okay this is the thing that i like this is the thing that the people like let's just try to let's just try to get together on this one and see if we can you know make something that's in, in a way like a fusion to me but to most people just a really good pepperoni right yeah. yeah now since you've come from the the culinary end of things when it came to the building out of your restaurant and making the environment because you know that the one thing about lupo is it is a very kind of cozy intimate almost like you're in a house but in but in a restaurant kind of vibe to it um, you know, how, how much did you look into those types of opportunities to, uh, really set that mood? And cause it really goes with the Neapolitan pizza. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. And you're making me miss my dining oh. room. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I love it too. And it's, uh, a lot of that is painstakingly intentional. Um, the, the brick that's exposed in there, you know, we spent a lot of time ripping away drywall and exposing all of that. Um, and, you know, when we were done with everything, we had these, you know, wood floors, brick walls, and it was a little bit boomy in there. And so we had um, a buddy who's a sound engineer actually build these baffles that we have all over the ceiling. And it was just night and day. You could just tell the difference in like 
the the um, the echoes right. and just the boominess of the room. It just I think a big part of the coziness is that that sound deadening. And yeah, it just kind of like brings everybody in. You can you can talk at like a relaxed you know uh, yeah volume yeah. and still hear each other. It was that the the building you're in was that was that a house before or it was um so it was a house at one point and then when when we bought it it had been converted into an art studio okay. oh wow um yeah but it still retained all of the features of the house right. when it was the studio i got you uh and it's what 1860 so i imagine peeling back those layers were <laughs> <laughs> insane right it was it was wild um uh, i mean we replaced every floor joist in that building uh took the old ones out and made the bar out of them you know tried to reclaim all the wood we could uh but yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of weird stuff in that building because it's so old yeah. so, so start uh, to finish on that building what like how many months year <laughs> about a year, about a year. yeah That's... it was about a year yeah uh and it was you know it was all of our first foray into um, commercial construction and you learn a lot uh, <laughs> yeah doing a project like that up yeah. to your eyeballs and permits yeah yeah hey everyone it's katie art director at pizza today here to interrupt your podcast with a short commercial break your friends at Message on Hold are happy to introduce our voiceover IP service. Message on Hold Phones is our solution for phone service. If the internet goes down, it's no problem. You can still take online and phone orders. No busy signal ever. Professionally recorded, customized messaging for your business ensures that your customer gets the message that you want delivered to them every time. Save money and get new phones. Visit www.messageonholdservice.com slash phones. If you're looking for a POS provider that truly understands pizzerias, look no further than PDQ. Designed from the ground up for the exact needs of pizzerias, PDQ POS has been doing pizza ordering, delivery, and takeout for over 32 years. With all the functionality you need in today's environment, including online ordering, rewards, seamless integration, contactless functionality, and so much more, PDQ is your single source for, well, everything. Learn more today at pdqpos.com or call 877-968-6438. That's 877-968-6430. And now, back to the slice. Now, I know you uh, you added on your patio in phases, correct? Um, you you correct. kind of started. And I know it... it um, I, I love your patio. <laughs> I went to a dog. I went to a Thank dog you. event there. It was like a fundraiser yeah. for, I, I don't know if it was Kentucky yeah. Humane Society, but it was one of them. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's, yeah, was, yeah, but having the dogs all on the patio was really nice. But um, but your patio has its own vibe, and you actually have events out there quite a bit. Um, I know I've seen um, some DJs spinning um, out there. You've had mm -hmm. a couple of things going. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your patio and what kinds of things you're doing with sure. it? So, you know, we've got this beautiful patio. It's um, It butts right up to the flood wall, which, you know, is, if nothing else, uh, visually interesting. <laughs> and How many uh, people does it see? built this... I'd say we've got probably 30 seats. And then there, inside you like have that. what? 60s? 70, 70 okay. 75, yeah. something like that. Nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the patio was just kind of, like you said, it, it kind of came in steps. You know, we had this space, uh, we used it just as we could, and it's kind of evolved into this, you know, space that I really love. The, the thing that we've done most recently is taken down the fence to the, uh, to Frankfurt so you can actually get more of an open feeling out there. Um, but yeah, we do all sorts of stuff. Like we will have DJs out there. We'll have, you know, little events. Anytime that there's anything to do outside, we try to connect that to the parking lot and it works pretty yeah. well for us. Now, the one thing you were, uh, I think you were really smart on because parking is always an issue for a lot of pizzerias and uh, you happen to get that gravel lot uh, kind of cut a corner for yeah. your parking, you know, uh, how, how did you totally. make that happen? <laughs> that was, um, that was complicated. You know, it, when we were building this out, the, they were saying that we needed, you know, more parking mm -hmm. spots. They were saying that we didn't have as many as we needed. And that was kind of an unforeseen problem for us because, you know, so many restaurants don't have parking lots any bigger than ours but they rely on street uh -huh. parking. 
Um, we don't have street parking on that block of Frankfurt, so we needed that extra space. So we got access to the gravel lot um, around the same time that we were opening. And yeah, that opened up, you know, like 20 spots. Uh, which is yeah. that a thing that you lease or is that a like? So we lease it. Yeah, uh, we, we the family bought that par uh, portion of it. And they've got the two buildings that are connected to it, and they rent gotcha. them out to other tenants. So basically, it's split up. There's tenants renting the buildings, and then we're renting the parking lot. Okay, cool. Sure. Okay, so when you when you first opened up, you kind of opened up with a bang. You know, what kind of went into being able to launch successfully? Uh, you know, and come out just firing right from the start. Um, you know, I think the the biggest key to, to a successful opening is to to expect there to be a crowd and to know how to handle it um i think that a lot of restaurants will make the mistake in their opening of you know being naive about the the crowds of people that that i feel you know most times will come out just to check out a new spot uh, and it's the most pivotal, crucial time because there's so many people that don't understand the restaurant industry well enough to know that you can't really judge a restaurant by how they perform yeah. in, that, uh, in that moment. Um, you know, I've seen this a few times. So when we got ready to do our opening, I knew that we were going to be busy. I knew that we needed to be prepared. And I knew that I didn't want to run out of yeah. food. I didn't want to, you know, that, I feel like that's the thing that you see at a lot of openings. Um, and so we, you know, we tested everything as well as we could. We got ourselves as ready as I was comfortable with. And, you know, I, I feel like we, we got through those openings, um, pretty, pretty, uh, seamlessly, uh, which to me is saying a lot, you know, I think that that's, that's the, that's not always as easy as it sounds. And you also, uh, garnered a lot of media attention right from the start. Uh, was that intentional yeah. or were you actually, you know, pushing out some, uh, some special things to the media or is it just, they, they kind of knew you? Uh, well, you know, it definitely helped that they knew me from the food truck. Um, you know, and that, that made it easy for, I think people to, to jump on the story. They, they had a, a point of reference. Uh, you know, a lot of the people in the media that, that did stories, you know, these are people that I had met through the food truck. Um, you know, there's the element of, you know, my sister and my brother-in-law, they, they have this, um, they have this angle with the band that they're in. Um, they know a lot of media right. people through that. Um, and you know, we, we tried not to get the too much attention on that because we knew it would kind of overtake it. Um, and it's the balance of, you know, okay, yeah, these people who did this thing that you, that you know, and it's, it's very easy to to write and talk about are doing this thing like, um, you know, trying to guide the articles towards not just talking about the band right. or like, or even the, the food truck, you know, I, I, I really wanted people to understand that, like, I, I'm glad that you know me from the food truck. I'm glad that you had positive experiences with it, but like, this is a whole yeah, new thing. Absolutely. <laughs> you had actually mentioned yeah. uh, the band and probably no one in the pizza world knows what your sister was involved with, <laughs> what, what, what she's a yeah. part of. So, um, you know, coming from your culinary background and her as a musician, you know, uh, it, it's a unique combination to start. And then being brother and sister, uh, I could not imagine opening a business with my siblings. So, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. it's a pretty unique environment to have. For sure. Uh, you know, me and my sister have always been very close. Uh, this is the first time we've worked on anything of this size together. And, you know, it's not easy. Um, it's, it's, uh, there are definitely times when it's struggling and it's, it's, uh, it's trying and it's, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's definitely a challenge. Um, but, you know, we, uh, we're making it work and, you know, it's, yeah. It's a good thing. Now, what are your um, kind of those roles between, um, you know, who does what and uh, kind of who leads what? You know, are they more in the background or um, or kind of is it broken out into different areas? They're definitely more in the background. Uh, the majority of the time, you know, their their schedule with their band, it keeps them extremely busy. Um, so, you know, a lot of the time they are just 
you know, they're they're stuck in a tour van wishing that they could be at the restaurant, yeah. you know, talking about pizza and pasta, uh, but they're they're stuck. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I definitely you know handle the day to day stuff at the restaurant, um, and they come in when they're in town, and you know, for the most part, I, I try to just you know um, get them get them in when I can and get them taken care of and get them to where they can sit down and try the new dishes and all that. And, um, it, yeah. it works pretty well. You know, she did say in her email, uh, cause I had contacted her, uh, first that you are the brains. So, um, so that's, that's a pretty good, uh, compliment from your sibling, uh, about, uh, about okay. your restaurant. Yeah. Um, the, no, that's, that's very sweet. Um, you know, the, I think when she's, when she says that she knows that this is something I've wanted to do since I was, since I was young and like a lot of this is a, a passion right. project for me. Uh, yeah. The menu did you, uh, did you go, did you train anywhere or did you just kind of go around picking things up from different restaurants? So I got into restaurants when I was like 18 or 19. Um, and you know, at that point it was just a means to an end, you know, this was the job that I could get that I didn't have to wake up early to go to. Um, and you know, when I started working there, I was working with kids that were, you know, out of culinary school and I was working with chefs that, you know, were from CIA and stuff. And, you know, a lot of these guys told me like, we've spent all this money and all this time in these culinary schools and we just like, wish we hadn't, uh, I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know about, you know, braising beef right now today. And like, I paid a lot of money for somebody to teach me how to do that. And so, you know, that kind of started me on this path of like, you know, let's see how much of this yeah. I can get for free. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's exactly how I went. You know, I, I worked in restaurants just trying to work with people who had been trained, people who had gone to school or had done it the same way that I was trying to do it for long enough that could teach me stuff. And, you know, I, I worked with some great chefs. I've worked with some great cooks and I've learned so much through all my experiences in restaurants, but no formal training, uh, pizza wise, that's all just kind of playing around. Um, pizza wise, you know, a lot of the restaurants that I gravitated towards okay. were pizza places. Um, the, the first pizza job I had was at wood burning, uh, pizza at Primo. And, um, you know, that was, that was what gave me the, the bug that, that got me hooked. Um, from there, I went to a couple different pizza places. I worked at the, op I was in the opening lineup at Papalino's when they started, um, yeah. Alan Rosenberg. And, you know, he taught me a lot about, uh, fermenting dough. You know, he was talking about like, you know, room temperature ferment versus cold and the differences in them. And, you know, up until that point, I hadn't heard anybody talk like that about pizza and this, that he turned on some, he, he lit some lights up for me um you know i worked at zaz yeah. for a little while um i i did uh and i i you know learned a lot about like that business model as well you know they taught me a lot about it um so yeah i'd say like at least 50 percent of my cooking career has been gotcha. in pizza places and you know you you meet guys that just do nothing but pizza I'm yes sure you yeah. <laughs> yeah we definitely know uh, those folks <laughs> and it, it it really is like a it's it's like a family it's like a cult you know these these guys that get into pizza places they don't want to work in any other type of food and they just keep doing pizza um you know i've got some of them at lupo and i it's it's definitely um yeah it's a thing and i i definitely feel like i um i hail from that yeah. clan but know? i think you also hail from a, another clan as far as a uh, business-minded uh, you know they say you never go into the pizza business if you just want to make pizzas right <laughs> so tell me about right. a little bit yeah. about you know building a business and making sure that you know you're successful at it well so i mean you know building the business it's like we talked earlier it's it's a lot about education it's a lot about letting people know what you're doing and you know trying to find ways of uh, you know ways of getting that to people in the most effective way um you know one of the things that's great about our concept is that we can we can make pizzas very quickly um you know we've got a very laid back cozy dining room but like you know if people are coming in for quick service we can get them in and out really 
really quickly. But yeah, you know, building the business, there's lots of like trying to find additional revenue sources and stuff like that. Like we built a last year, a food truck, uh, pizza oven trailer. And, uh, you know, the idea here is that we're, we're trying to, you know, market while we make a little bit of money at these bigger events. Uh, and what we've built is this like all enclosed trailer with a deck oven built in okay. the back of it. That is cool. Super cool. Um, and yeah, we we'll take it out to festivals and, you know, we'll, we'll kind of, we'll use I was it. Say, is, it a, is it a marketing line also, item? For sure. Yeah. But we'll, you know, we'll, we'll make some money out there doing it too. Um, and, you know, growing the business in those kind of ways is, is definitely what we have been trying in the last year. Um, and it's been working well for That's us. That's awesome. You know? uh, so, your menu, uh, and of course, I'm going to tell you right now. I love sting like beets. Uh, you know, I think that's uh, I, I think that's probably what your most popular pizza <laughs> on your menu. <laughs> you know, it it usually Margarita. is. It fluctuates, but well, as much as I love your pizza, pizza, I think I, I your pasta just as much or more. You're, yeah. you're you make those like oh. in house fresh every day, right? Yeah. Yep. Every day, um, and you know, we talk obviously a lot about pizza with, with you guys. Um, and that's a huge part of our, our brand and our identity. Um, but there is, there's almost an equal amount of work that we're putting and thought and time. What's your sales breakdown here. between the, between the pizza and pasta? Like how much of your sales is pizza versus pasta? So when we first started out, I would say if I had to guess, I'd say it's probably like 80% was pizza. Um, and you know, it was like that for a while. I mean, that, that was kind of just like what we thought was yeah. just our model. Um, and you know, we've in the first menu in the first year of menus, a lot of the pastas that we did were, um, less traditional and more just kind of like, uh, using seasonal ingredients as, as, as well as I could, uh, it, to me in that first uh, in the first year and a half, I'd say like we really hyper focused on seasonality and doing things, you know, that were that we were getting from our farmers at the time, even if that meant that they weren't yeah. going to be traditional and that meant that they were going to be a little bit, you know, less familiar to people in the last year, I'd say we've we've kind of. Um, we still have those hyper seasonal pastas, but we've started doing more traditional stuff. Like we've got a carbonara that's been on the menu for like nine months now. And it's beautiful. It's delicious. It's, you know, we make the pancetta in house. We're curing pancetta. Um, you know, all the pasta is made fresh daily. And, you know, the thing is that people know what carbonara is and they're ordering it way more. So we've started to see that breakdown, that 80% pizza, 20% pasta. It's starting to shift. To where now, like my guy that's working saute, you know, he's getting rocked as hard as like the two guys running the pizza station. So we're doing, if I had to guess in the last six months, it's probably been more like a 60-40 oh. split oh, wow. on pizza and pasta. <laughs> yeah. Which is exactly what I, you know, that was what I wanted. I wanted people to to come yeah. and, and get both. Uh, so Max, your your menu is just top notch. Like you, you know, every ingredient is just, you know, I think has been selected so finitely. Um, so what, uh, you know, what's gone into creating this uh, beautiful menu you have? Well, so, um, you know, the menu is definitely uh, determined by what we can get available from our farmers, you know, what, what we can find locally, uh, and seasonally seasonally is the big thing. Um, the, it's important to me that we're using stuff that is coming in from people that I can have conversations with people that I can have dialogues with about like, you know, what are, what's good right now and what do you have coming in two months? Um, you know, planning a menu is, it's difficult if you don't know if, if, if all of your ingredients are constantly changing, and you don't know what they're going to be. You're, you're running blind, uh, being able to talk with your farmer and like, you know, have conversations about what you'll be doing in two months helps you decide what you're going to be doing the, for the two months leading up to that so that you are left with, you know, the right stock for this dish that you want to do with this ingredient, you know, stuff like that. Uh, that's kind of a simplification of the planning that goes into, you know, 
adapting with the seasonality and yeah the and you, you've also incorporated things like um, uh oysters yeah. and things so these specialty items you know how have you been able to use these uh kind of higher food cost items in your menu uh and still stayed pretty viable so the oysters were important to me you know i love oysters um i've i want them on the menu forever uh and it's one of these things where you kind of have to just say, look, we're Neapolitan pizza and oysters and that's it. And you, you have to get people used to the idea so that when they come in, they know that, you know, this isn't some subpar oyster experience that you might have. This is like, you're going to get like, you know, you're going to get oysters from the Pacific that are, you know, fresh right. brought in that day. They're going to be shucked properly and they're going to be served with, you know, the condiments that you would expect in like a nice oyster place. Um, you know, getting people comfortable with that idea in a pizzeria environment or in a, you know, casual Italian environment was something that I really wanted to establish from the beginning. And we just did it. We just kept doing it. And we said, look, we got oysters. We got them every day. And um, we, I would say at this point, it's, probably our most popular um you know appetizer opening dish um which is great you know i'd say we we we, we yeah. accomplished what we were looking for there um but you know expensive ingredients you just have to you have to know how to how to price it and you have to know how to incorporate it into a dish um you know like the soprasada on the sting like a bee that's that's expensive stuff it's from fermani um which is a charcuterie place in san francisco and they, you know, they, they don't make it to be cheap. It's, it's the, the best I've had stateside, honestly. And, you know, a lot of guys wouldn't buy the best that they can find to put on their menu because it's usually not cost effective. But, you know, with proteins, especially on pizza and especially in Neapolitan pizza style, like we're looking for less. Less is more. If we cover pizzas, and I know we do with the pepperoni for the uh, – pepperoni jabroni but like that's kind of the point of that pizza but for like the for the more traditional ones the more balanced ones like a, a, a soprasada sting like a bee like we're using such small amounts of it and so even though it's like 20 something bucks a pound we can actually get it into our margins by giving you know right. an the appropriate flip. you know amount small amounts yeah. for sure it goes a long way exactly exactly right yeah but yeah, that's that's kind of how we we balance these more expensive ingredients, and it, it's the same with cheese. You know, we use pretty expensive cheeses on some of the pizzas. Um, you know, Taleggio is not cheap, uh, Cambazzola is not cheap. Uh, but if you use appropriate amounts of it, you you can find that there's a balance you can find because of the strength of that cheese. I mean, Taleggio does not hide. Um, you can use one ounce oh, for sure. on a twelve inch margar or on a twelve inch pizza. And it's you're gonna know it's there in every single bite. I, I also um, I also saw that you were doing uh, pasta making classes. Oh yeah. In the restaurant. Yeah. Yeah, they've been really popular for us. Um, we've we've started doing them. Um, we're basically we'll just like clear out the dining room and then replace it with um, the work tables from the kitchen. Oh, wow. And then we'll set up pasta makers all around the table and we'll bring people in and we'll just show them how to make, you know, usually we'll roll sheets of pasta. We'll do like machine cut pasta and then a few like hand form shapes. Um, and it's been super popular. People have been loving it. That's been great. Now, um, as far as like food costs go, uh, you know, where, where do you guys kind of like to sit, uh, in your, with your restaurant? Where do you like to, what, uh, margin do you like to be in? Well, so, you know, the, the traditional model is always to keep it at like a third, like 33% is, is pretty standard. Um, with pizza and pasta, you really can mm -hmm. get lower than that though. Um, because a lot of this is, um, you know, it, it's, it's flour and water. It's, uh, you know, pizza is, is an easy thing to make cheap on the ingredient side of it, which is why you see so many pizza models all over the U.S. that are just, you know, just putting out <laughs> yeah. nothing but the most. And <laughs> uh, for me, you have a responsibility as a producer to take these – inexpensive ingredients and and do something special with them um so you know even though we've got 
incredibly low margins on the flour and water that go into a margarita yeah. or a marinara pizza. Um, you've got an incredible amount Absolutely. of labor. And, you know, it's the handling of the dough uh, is absolutely the biggest part. Um, the, the dough is like, it's, it's, an, it's a huge, you know, multi-day, multi-step process that, you know, takes probably four or five active hours oh, wow. per day. Um, so, you know, you, you make up your margins on food in other places. There's, there can be, there can be higher labor at points, but, you know, in general, we try to, we, to answer your question, we, we try to, um, yeah, stay between I gotcha. Like 20 and 30. Um, now you were talking about how much you kind of missed hanging out with your employee family. Uh, you know, how many employees you have and Thank kind you. of tell me a little bit about that core culture that you've uh, created there. So we've got probably 20 folks um, and some of them have been there since day one. Uh, we've still got some some people that were on the opening team, which is incredible. You know, I feel so honored and lucky to have the people that I do. And, uh, you know, we've got folks that that I feel genuinely see what we're doing and appreciate and um, get excited about you know, what we're doing. Like I've, I've got guys that are eager to come in every day so that they can learn something new. And, you know, for me, like that's a dream come true. Like to be in an environment full of like-minded people that want to learn and grow together. Um, it, it's, it's my dream. Um, and, you know, in a lot of ways, more so than the, the output to the public, you know, is what we accomplish you know, behind closed doors in the kitchen um, and in the front of house too, you know, the, the, um, the training that we offer on Amari and, you know, Italian wines, like we've, we've had several people come through our doors that have never worked with Amari before. I didn't know what Amari was or what Campari was or something, you know, and they're learning all of this stuff and, and they get excited about it, you know, and that, that's the that's the most important thing to me with staff is that we get people to where they actually want to come into work because they're learning and they're now engaged. you uh with the with the learning process what is your training like uh you know as far as when when they when they're onboarded you know uh you know is it is it straight out of the gate let's get in there and do it or uh you know what kind of process is going on there um so in the kitchen it can be i mean well, wherever it is, it's, it's, you know, day one, we're just jumping right in. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely some shadowing shifts that happen, but for the most part, there's really no way, at least within my teaching style to get people, um, trained other than just throwing them in like, Hey, we're going to chop all this wood today. You know, like here's an ax, we're going to figure it out. You and me right now. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, there's nothing in this restaurant that we're doing that you can't teach within a day or two. Um, and then there's nothing that you can learn that you can't like become proficient at within a few weeks. Uh, making pasta is not hard once you know what the technique is and you get a quickness with it. Um, you know, and so the best way to train people is just to throw them in. Like we're going to make a hundred portions of cavatelli today. <laughs> and like, I'm going to sit here with you and do it. And it, we're not going to stop until we're done. So <laughs> you, you're going to learn. <laughs> uh, and, and that's really, you know, there's no shortage of tasks like yeah. that in a restaurant. And, you know, I, I love teaching people new things. And, you know, I, I love working with people who, enjoy learning them and we've got such an incredible staff right now yeah everybody is just a sponge they they want to learn everything they get why it's cool you know they they want to learn it even if the even if it's just to take with them mm -hmm. to their next right. job they want to learn it. and it it really it feels like i'm in a truly you know um blessed position to to have all of these skills to teach um, that people actually want to learn. And, you know, when you got wood fired Neapolitan pizza, like it's not just, 
it's not some lazy style. It's not some uh, passing fad. It's it's a it's a tradition, and you know if you can convince somebody of that, which shouldn't be hard, uh, it it only follows naturally that they would want Absolutely. to learn how to do it. Let's talk about lessons that you've learned and kind of where you've had those growing moments. Uh, you know, what what are those big le- lessons you've learned? Lessons learned. <laughs> there's been a lot. We hear that a lot from <laughs> operators. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, and, you know, uh, when we started this, I had, you know, management experience from the taco truck. Um, and you know, the taco truck was mine. It was my baby and anybody that worked on it worked directly under me. And that was, that was just how it was for years and years and years. Um, there wasn't the need for quite as much structure with the taco truck. If, if you can believe it, uh, I was, I was a little bit, uh, looser in a lot of my practices as far as, you know, like the number of events that we would work. You know, you don't have to be open Monday through Friday with the food. Sure. Truck. You whatever you want to be. Uh, and, you know, that I ran it like that for a long time. And, you know, I don't regret it. I, it was it was a it was a cool thing to do. Uh, but the restaurant gives it, there's mm-hmm. inherent structure in a restaurant. You know, you have to be open every day. There's certain things. This is my dream. You know, I won't let these things fall in uh, quality or in standards. And as long as all of those things are true, there's structure that has to exist. And so one of the big, biggest things that I learned, I would say, from this experience is, you know, how to transition my management style from someone who was like, hey, man, whatever, you know, let's crack some beers and <laughs> yeah. get through this dinner <laughs> rush uh, to somebody that's like, no, this is important that we do it the right way. Um, not only for me and my bottom line, but for you and what you're taking away from this. And if this is your daily, you know, if you're going to work here 40 hours a week for a couple of years, there's going to be structure so that you right. don't go. Got to be consistency. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so, yeah, the, that's definitely the biggest thing that I've learned is, is, you know, my management style has evolved um, and just learning how to work with a team um i have i've learned so much and I, I, there's a million things i've sh- i've learned that's but awesome that's the biggest uh, one. what kind of advice would you have for somebody that is like you they've always wanted to you know do this but they maybe haven't pulled the trigger yet now i know now is a unique time to ask this question but uh you know what advice do you have for a young operator or an aspiring operator who wants to get something off the ground uh my advice would be to start small you know i think uh the the food truck was a great intro into owning a restaurant um and but before that you know i worked in countless restaurants just as a cook and you know you you got to find out if you really if you really like it before you make a commitment because it's it's not very forgiving work it's it's not very easy work um you know but to the people that have already been paying their dues the people who have mm-hmm. already done it for years who are dreaming of opening their own spot um you know i think my advice would be to start small and 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 build a brand yeah. you know I think that that's the the most important thing is that you know the one thing that you can't replace any other way is the brand, and you can build that on the yeah. smallest level. I that love you it. Want to. Uh, yeah, that's right. awesome. Uh, well, what did we miss anything in 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 our conversation? You know, what what do you uh, what do you want to leave on? What do you, what do you want to tell the good people of the pizza world? You know, our pizza tribe. What do they need to know? You know, uh, I, 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 I'm excited to get back to work. I think like everybody is, I think, you know, like I said at the beginning of this, you know, let's take this time. And when we're, when we're through this, let's, let's take yeah. everything for granted a little bit less. Uh, I think that's, unfortunately, that is what's been going through my mind right. the most in the last few weeks. And I think it's a good enough message to end on. It's just, you know, let's let's get through this, but let's be strong. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Well, thanks so much, Max. Thanks for, uh, this has been great. Yeah. It's yeah. been a great chat. 
It's, it's actually good to talk to other people. Great. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks All a lot. Right. Be safe. Thank you so much. Take care. Rest. Thanks for joining us this week on The Hot Slice. Special thanks to Max Ballier for talking with us. Next week, we sit down with Tony Gemignani. Make sure to visit pizzatoday.com and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're at it, rate us and review us. And thanks for listening to The Hot Slice. We'll see you next week.